Peace and Black Power family, thank you for joining me yet again for another insightful and informational and hopefully educational video on Haitian history. Now, this video will be displayed on both of my channels, the Brother Hassan and the After the Revolution uh, YouTube channel because I kind of feel that the information is relevant to what we're going through today. And it also ties in Haitian history. So I'm kind of conflicted. So I was like, ah, well, you know what? Let me put it on both channels. So you might be watching this on the After the Revolution channel or you might be watching this on Brother Hassan channel. But anyway, with that being said, first and foremost, let me thank my brother Ugly King Truth for making this banging backdrop of African black history of all these Afro-Haitian leaders because Haitian history is black history. Let's never forget that. Haitian history is black history, all right? Secondly, I'd like to thank my sister Zuna out of Philly for providing me with this banging shirt, Answer the Bell, um, which is her company, which is kind of like a consulting company um, where she also deals with mental health. So if you have an intimate... Have an intimate... Have an intimate... If you're having any mental health issues, need someone to speak to, you have a relationship issues, hit her up at Queen Zuna on Instagram. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started with this video. So, today we're talking about the yellow fever outbreak that took place in Philadelphia in 1793. Now, again, I'm pretty sure everybody's like, what does that have to do with Haiti? What does that have to do with Haitian history? Why are you always reaching Brother Hassan? What does Philadelphia in 1793 have to do with Haitian history? Bro, pause it. Calm down. Calm down. Chill. Chill, my friend. I'm going to tell you right now what it has to do. In 1791, on the island of Haiti, Saint-Domingue, whatever you want to call it, the revolution had popped off, right? And so you had Haitians and French people leaving the island. Right. A lot of French people could not go back to France because France was in its own revolution as well. So a lot of them turned their backs to go to the United States. The United States opened their doors. The 13 colonies opened their doors to the French. And also you had the French in the West because they controlled Louisiana. Right. And so you had a lot of French people with their African slaves and some free people of color leaving, coming to the United States. Well, at that time. You had over 5,000 black Africans leave from Haiti and become the first free population of color in Philadelphia. So all the black people in Philadelphia, you might be descendants of Haitians, right? Because you had that migration that took place during the revolution, right? Where you had Haitians coming to Philadelphia. This is documented, right? There also, it is also believed that these so-called Africans that came from Haiti caused the yellow fever. But we know that not to be true now, obviously because we know the yellow fever comes from mosquitoes and dirty water and things like that, right? Anyway, getting back on topic. The first person I'm gonna talk about in this episode is a sea captain by the name of Steven Gerard. This Urugu, this European, was doing business when the revolution popped off in Haiti. Much of Philadelphia's prosperity comes because of our international trade to the Caribbean, to Europe, with China. All of this is creating prosperity. No one is more responsible for this success or the global scope of its business than the hard-driving French immigrant, Stephen Girard. Girard embodies everything at play here. He's building a huge global business, trading particularly in the Caribbean with the island of Saint-Domingue, today's Haiti, which had become the richest colony in the world. But African slaves who are literally being worked to death revolt. In the violent uprising, Girard's trading ships are stranded at sea. French troops are called in to put down the revolt. But they are decimated. And so he kept in communication with Tucson and, and all the other leaders and things like that. Well, when Tucson went to prison, Tucson gave this sea captain, Stephen Gerard, uh, approximately $6 million, right? 
to bring back some weapons and arms so they can continue the fight against the British and the French and the Spanish and whoever wanted some smoke with Haiti, right? So when Toussaint went up, end up going to jail in France because Napoleon tricked him, the sea captain, Stephen Gerard, did not return the money back to Haiti. He came to Philadelphia and became an entrepreneur with the stolen money. He created a college, which is called Gerard College, which still exists to this day, okay? He invested his money in coal mining and in agriculture, right? And he also uh, created Gerard Bank, which now today is Citizens Bank. So the money that helped fund and, and, and push uh, Philadelphia forward, right, was stolen money from Haiti. And some of the first black people in Philadelphia were Haitians escaping the Haitian Revolution. You see how I'm tying that history together? Oh, y'all wasn't ready for that. Y'all was not ready for that. Coincidentally, during that same time period, because remember, Philadelphia was considered to be the capital of the United States or the 13 colonies at that time period. You had George Washington and all the other founding fathers, quotation marks, leave to go to Virginia, and that is when, when George Washington said that Washington, D.C. will be the capital of the United States or the 13 colonies. It was because of that outbreak, because Philadelphia was so, you know, plagued with disease. Remember, the, the Declaration of Independence was signed in Philadelphia, 1776. So Philadelphia was considered to be like the capital of the 13 colonies until this outbreak. And then they went to Washington, D.C. and he said, bam, 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 here's where we're going to do everything at in Washington, D.C. Moving forward, right? You know, we, we have, are we coming to a consensus? We understand that the, some of the first black people in Philadelphia came from Haiti, right? Some of them, not all, some of them. And then you also have Philadelphia being built up with stolen money from Haiti. This is a fact. This is not me reaching. This is not me, you know, pulling things out of my, my derriere, out of my behind. This is historical facts. Now we want to move forward to what's taking place during this yellow fever epidemic, right? You have a brother named Richard Allen who was huge in the black community. He was very much inspired by the Haitian Revolution. He talked about the Haitian Revolution uh, so much. Um, he, he spoke sermons about the Haitian Revolution, and he had a lot of pull in the black community at the time. And so when the yellow fever outbreak took place, he was real cool with a Yorugu by the name of Benjamin Rush. Now, Benjamin Rush was a doctor in that, in that, in that time period, in that era in Philadelphia. And Benjamin Rush convinced him that somehow black people were immune to the yellow fever epidemic. And they have no more trusted friend among Philadelphia's white elite than Dr. Benjamin Rush, an outspoken abolitionist and supporter of Allen's new church. For the type of relationship and the type of closeness that Allen enjoyed with Rush, it was absolutely unique and unusual. There were a number of people now in that time who professed the same things that Rush did, that all human beings were created equal but really didn't want those close relationships. As yellow fever spreads, Rush sees very few cases of the disease among African Americans. He believes that blacks are immune, and therefore they had an obligation, a responsibility to serve their city. Rush knows how desperately the city needs nurses. He persuades Allen and his fellow leader, Absalom Jones, to organize blacks to serve stricken white Philadelphians. Though Allen and Jones see plenty of evidence that blacks are not immune, they believe that volunteering will strengthen their case for equality and recognition. Keep watching. This is a part I need to pay attention to right here. Keep watching. Only when Frost finally arrives, is the city at last relieved. But since mid-August, more than one in 10 Philadelphians have died. Left devastated and feeling powerless, Philadelphia is gripped by despair, anger, and accusation. There are sharp and widely published reports accusing black nurses of stealing and price gouging. Richard Allen was furious. 
and felt betrayed. He sat down with a pen and paper and he began to write his own account. And he began to correct item by item the things that were leveled against him and against the other workers. His reputation becomes the first copywritten book by an African in America. Why is all this important? Do you see this? They basically accused black people of stealing and, and, and getting people sick. I mean, this has not changed. And this is why I say this information is relevant to Haitian history and also to what we're going through today. Right now, we're in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic, right? And they're trying to make black people the so-called guinea pigs of this pandemic. They're trying to make us the face of this pandemic. The same way they did in Philadelphia in 1793 with the yellow fever, with some of the things they always done to us, right? And this is why this history is important. Not only does it connect African American history to Haitian history and Caribbean history, but it also connects into what we're going through to this day. And this is why these things are important. This is why it's important to study your history and know your history because you're able to avoid those things. And it's sad that the brother Richard Allen had to go through that and had to be embarrassed by that. And he went through that whole traumatic situation when dealing with Urugu. But hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully this video enlightened you in some way, shape or possible. Like, comment, subscribe, share this video. Um, the way that you can pay me, if you truly appreciate what I do, is by sharing the information. Um, I don't ask for any monetary funds or anything like that. I just ask that you share it, and that's the way that you can pay me. Until next time, family, think black, stay black, love black, support black, and that's real African black power. I love this backdrop, man. Yo, you see this, man?